Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed time in your groups. One of the things we wanted you to begin to experience was the power of conversation, the way in which listening to one another, really listening, responding, having that social-emotional connection we talked about from the previous conversation really helps to invigorate and connect with you. It's how we build relationship. Because as we move into this next, this next section, what we're gonna be exploring is really the power of empathy and the way in which we are hardwired to experience and express it. So mm -hmm. Vicki, I'm excited. You cut me off in the last section. I'm very excited for this <laughs> section to, to dive back in with you, so please. That wasn't very empathetic of That's me. That's <laughs> right, I didn't want to comment. I, I took some time, you know, I, some, some guys in the sound booth listened to me. They, they were good listeners, so. <laughs> okay, well to understand this next se uh, session, we're going to pull that, uh, that image of your brain up back up. It's on your worksheet as well, and we're going to be covering that a little bit right now. So I want you to notice the amygdala at the bottom here of your diagram. So that is a part of, your, of your, our brains that is, uh, has been very helpful to keep us uh, alive all these years. Uh, it is necessary for survival. What it does is it kind of keeps us on alert for um, un unexpected dangers. All right, so imagine a hunting party that's returning to the village in the dark on heightened alert uh, to danger. That uh, you don't know what's lurking in the dark. You don't know if there's a tiger out there. So the amygdala keeps your body kind of on edge. So if anything jumps out at you, you are prepared uh, to attack or defend yourself or to run away and survive, okay? So it is, it is helpful. The problem is these days, um, the likelihood that something is gonna jump out, us, out of us, out at us, is unlikely. Um, it has, still has its, its uh, needs. However, it, there's situations where it is not working to our best, especially when we have unspoken or unnamed fears. Uh, th we find this where we might have had traumas from the past that we'd rather not talk about or soldiers that come home where they've lived through experiences they don't want to talk about, but then it ends up causing uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. So it turns out that these, when we have unnamed fears so that there's no focal point that the brain can name and say, this is what's bothering me. Instead, when they're unnamed, what happens is it activates the ACC, so the, the pain center it gets activated. It also activates the amygdala, and that causes pain, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and phobias. The thing is that the, is amazing is that if we can give the, a person the space to talk about it and to actually name the fear. So it, 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 it turns out that actually, if you actually let someone talk stuff through, they will, their subconscious will eventually bring things around to where they may be able to name the fear. And once that happens, and they can give an, an explicit focus to what's troubling them, what we find that it activates the right ventral prefrontal cortex. So if you look right underneath that red box where it says distressing aspect of the psychological, that's where your prefrontal cortex. So it moves it to the reasoning center of your brain. It down regulates the fear and pain of emotions associated with both the ACC and it, the amygdala. Basically, the rat, once you can name it, you, can, you have power over it. And so no longer is it a nameless fear. You, your amygdala and your ACC down regulate, which means you can relax. So let me give you an example of this in real life. In chaplaincy, they give you uh, case studies where uh, other chaplains uh, went and visited uh, patients and they talk about, they write up the experience so you can, it's all anonymous, but you learn from the experience. So there's this chaplain that went into a room uh, for, of a patient who had a lot of anxiety before their surgery. And this man was married and he had not only high anxiety, but when, you, when, you're in, when you're in that state, you're in a very bad physiological state. You have high blood pressure, you have all these other uh, more out of the normal range of body changes that are not healthy for going into surgery. So part of the purpose of having a chaplain go in is to have someone to talk to 
so that maybe you can relax naturally and get your blood pressure down and stuff so you are in a better physiological state so then you have a better outcome with, with the surgery. So in the process of uh, talking to the chaplain, the man suddenly realized, I haven't made a will. And suddenly he had not realized that that was troubling him. And the thing is, in the hospital, you can make a legal will in the hospital. And once he, he was able to name it, he was able to do something about it. And once he had done that, he was much more relaxed as he went into surgery. So there, that's a very practical case of why it's important to be able to talk about things and what a big difference it makes uh, to be able to just have someone who's a listener to allow you to process what your unnamed fears are, and it helps in a very practical way. I'm hearing in that, too, it, if I was in that same situation, I don't know if I necessarily would have first gone to, oh, you haven't made a will. I probably would have assumed, rightly, I'm in a hospital, I'm about to have surgery, that stresses me out. But clearly, listening it's not about putting what you think should be happening onto someone else. It's like giving them the opportunity to actually give, you know, voice in their own way to what's really stressing them out. So it's, it's again, that it's, it's necessary for both the person that's listening and for the person speaking. They have this kind of like dynamic that's very uh, vibrant and, and necessary kind of for the whole process. Right. And let me let, me let you learn from my mistakes. <laughs> Because I, I did chapel. I thought you were perfect, Vicky, but please. No, I learned things the hard way. So I, I, I'm a scientist, you know, not a listener. <laughs> and, but I learned a lot of really good stuff in chaplaincy. And one of the things is, like, if you want to be a good listener, don't ask questions leading with a question, why? Like, why do you feel that way? Because you're going to make the person feel like they have to justify what they're feeling to you. So just ask it in a different way. Like, what, what, may, what do you think made you feel that way? So any other way, or how, how did that make you feel? Or anything, just don't use the word why, because it might, you know, make them feel like you're starting an argument. Okay, that's one tip. But the other thing is, you're absolutely right. Um, don't ever feel like your role is to cheer them up. I mean, go in with a, a, a smile. You're happy to see them convey that with your face. But then once you're in there, your face should match whatever their face is. Your conversation should follow wherever they go, because... It would have been very easy to tell the man if he's feeling anxious about the surgery and stuff to say, oh, it'll be fine. These doctors are great. That's very common in the hospital. Uh, oh, this is a routine surgery. The thing is, I have to tell you, this man's outcome, he actually died during the surgery. So we don't have the power to tell these people, you'll be fine. This is just routine surgery. Hmm. These doctors are great. Because all those things can be true, but we still don't have the power to make sure you'll survive the surgery. And so our role is to let them talk about what their fears are. I'm afraid of dying during the surgery. Mm. I think I might need a will. Okay, I'll help you get a will. That's our role. And I think that that's one of the things that we really do a disservice in our, West, in our Western culture is we have deny death so much. In the Christian worldview, death is a natural part of life. Um, and I guess I just, uh, you know, I, I uh, invite you to take the Genesis class with me. I know this is not where I was going to talk Early about plug. it. We're going to plug it again later. <laughs> Early plug. But we have been taught, because of Augustine's interpretation of Genesis, that pain and death is punishment for sin. Right. And I want to assure you that it's not. Um, that pain and death are a natural part of God's good creation, and God loves us even when we feel pain, and God loves us even because even when we die. And that um, part of what we're called to do is walk with people as they walk through that valley of the shadow of death. And let me give you another uh, case that I experienced personally. I went into a room with a woman um, who... Uh, looked in pretty good uh, health, and, and I introduced myself as a chaplain, and she said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, actually, my job is really just to talk, let people talk about whatever they want to talk about. She said, I am so grateful you do that because, you know, she said, my family will not let me talk about cancer. My kids say, oh, you'll be fine. She said, I have stage four cancer now. 
I've been, you know, I had stage one, then two, three. I've been, you know, well for so long that they're used to, oh, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. They won't let me talk about it. You're being morbid, so now I can't talk about it. And she said, I wanted to go pick a, a gravestone in my plot because it's one of the only things I have control over still. And when I asked all my friends, none of them would come with me. They said I was just oh, being too gloomy or they didn't feel comfortable. The only person that ended up going with her, and it, it was the best day she'd had in the longest time, was a friend from her small town that had just, the friend had just lost her husband to cancer. And she had had the same, she had just lost her husband, and she had had the same experience. No one was willing to walk through it with her because it was morbid or, you know, oh, I don't know how to handle that. Well, the truth is they don't know how to handle it either. Someone that's been diagnosed with cancer or find out they have a, a life-threatening illness, they don't know how to handle it either. They've never been on that path. They haven't chosen that path. But our calling as followers of Jesus is to make sure they never walk that path alone. And we don't have to have the right words to say. You don't have to have words of wisdom. You don't need to have platitudes. Well, God needs another angel in heaven. Please don't say that. Remember that Jesus wept at Lazarus' tomb. He knew that he was going to raise Lazarus in just a few moments, and yet he still wept. It is still a loss, but we're supposed to make sure that we are grieving with those who grieve and we rejoice with those who rejoice. So just follow the emotions of the person you're listening to, and that's the greatest gift we can give. I, I had a professor tell me once, let me remind you, there are no experts in grief care, and yeah. no one is an expert in dying. If you, if, you, if you lay that to the side, then you're ready to to realize you're not bringing anything into those conversations. You're there to receive whatever the conversations That's right. are and what they need to happen. Thank you for sharing such beautiful testimony. Thank you. On that. And, and, you know, we think that we're not equipped to do this. Oh, that's for the professional pastors and stuff or the professional chaplains. No. It's, it's for all of us. You know why? Because we're all hardwired for empathy. Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe me, my question is, have you ever felt the urge to yawn when someone across the room yawned, that was your empathy kicking in. So I want you to look at this at your screen now. You'll see that um, this baby yawning. And what I'm going to show you now is that all of us have been hardwired with this mirror neuron and mentalizing system. When I talk about the mirror neuron system in your brain, it helps you understand what the other person is doing. For example, here, the mirror neur neuron system helps you detect and imitate what another person is doing. So we see this baby is stretching her mouth and closing her eyes, so we see the baby is yawning. Now, if we look at the mentalizing system, so we go to the next slide. The mentalizing system helps us understand why they're doing it. Okay, so the, the, uh, the mentalizing system you can kind of think of as mind reading, okay? So we see that the baby is doing this because she is sleepy, all right? So we go to the next slide. Together, the mirror neuron system and the mentalizing system help us with effect matching and empathy. And together, these allow humans to share and understand the emotional and, me and, bleh, the emotional and mental states of others. So when we talk about mirror neurons, um, what we don't realize is that this allows our face to mirror the face of the person we're looking at, and we feel their emotion. So. If you're sitting in a room and you're talking and laughing with your friends and suddenly someone walks in the room and their face is just crestfallen, you don't, no one has to tell you to stop laughing. Your face, you don't even realize it automatically starts matching what the face you see is. And you don't realize this, but as a consequence, you start to taste their emotion. If they are sad, you start to feel sadness. If they are angry, you, your face is matching it, and you are starting to feel a little bit of anger. So it turns out 
and this is not a judgment or anything, but I'm just telling you a <laughs> scientific fact, that if we get Botox injections where it freezes the muscles in our face, it actually makes it harder for us to recognize emotions in other human beings because our, our muscles can't match the face we see. Does that make sense? That may not be the most relevant thing we learned tonight, but that may be one of the most interesting things uh, we learned yeah, tonight. Yeah, this is that's, all about interesting, that, you that's, know. That's fascinating. Wow. You know, so, so, go ahead. Wow, so no, you're just saying that there's, there's something almost subconscious that our body does. I walk in, I see you stressed. My body is hardwired to naturally respond to what you're going through. That's right. So we call that effect matching. So go back to the previous slide. Sorry, I'm still there. So effect matching, that term means that I feel what you feel. So for example, when we are watching other people experiencing pain, or like if we're watching animals on National Geographic or blue, is it blue planet? Hmm? Blue plant. One of those. One of those. One of those where we see the predator attacking the prey animal and we assume, oh my gosh, that's got to hurt so much because we're cringing because we're feeling the pain. We're actually feeling a little bit of pain in your body because of what you're seeing on the screen. We just have to remember their body is filled with opioids, so they're not feeling what we think they're feeling. But that's another point. But when we see a homeless person, that's why we feel emotional pain. When we hear a baby crying or they've fallen and we feel something inside, like I need to get up and go do something, or we see people on the side of the road, their car is broken down, and we feel like I need to pull over and do something, that is our effect matching. We feel their pain, and it's urging us to empathetic motivation. So we're going to go to the next slide. It turns out when this, this, these regions of our brain that create this empathetic motivation are triggered, it's releasing this neurochemical oxytocin in our brains. So one of the things that we kind of talked about last week is this is the one chemical that balances back out cortisol. Cortisol is that stress hormone that when we have, on, like if we were in the, fight or flight, adrenal response, like a lion's after us, we would use it up and it would be great and it would save our life. But in the daily grind of our lives, when we have low-grade stress all the time and we're not relieving it, we have high blood pressure, midway great gain, all these negative things because we have builds up of cortisol and we're not getting rid of it in healthy ways. Oxytocin balances it out and gets it back to the proper levels. And ironically, we get it from giving empathy to others. Wow. And also, what this drug does, well, I call it a drug, but what this chemical does is it also gives us the courage to help others, even when it might be under difficult or distressing circumstances. So this is where, like, okay, this is where you have someone that um, there might be blood involved, and they still go in and help. Like, maybe normally under circumstances you would have an aversion to blood, but you see the distress of the person and you act anyway, that could very well be the empathy and the oxytocin kicking in. Or, you know, a kid throws up. I mean, John normally would go the other way, but, you know, he would go and help because he's got that empathy kicking in. You know, the same thing with a, a burning building or a car wreck where it could be dangerous circumstances and yet someone steps in and, and, and helps. That is... One of the, 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 the aspects of this oxytocin that's all tied up in empathy, we are actually given the chemical backing and the hardwiring that's necessary for this costly love. So let's go to the next slide. So when we give empathy givers, and there's empathy receivers, when we are offering this love and care, it's releasing this oxytocin, which reduces the cortisol and the stress. When we are when we have someone that's receiving care, we're releasing those endogenous opioids and we're leaving their pain. So in God's grace, when we do the things that God has asked us to do, then we are blessing both the sufferer and the non-sufferer. Excellent. So we've heard a lot about uh, the importance of conversation, and we started it off a little light there, and now we're going to be moving into a different kind uh, of activity where we're going to be taking uh, off the gloves, so to speak, but also recognizing it's really key to hear this again. You, you're not supposed to be an expert at this. 
You're not supposed to be able to walk into every situation and suddenly be the most compassionate, awesome listener uh, of all time. But what it's about is making yourself willing and able to at least sit down and I think be used by God in, in, in a time and a space to receive the conversation and not feel the obligation. Uh, I, I don't know if you're like me, but I always tell people, if you tell me I don't have to know something, that takes a lot of pressure off. I can, I can be a fool anywhere, so I can sit down and try. You're gonna be a lot better than this, but I wanna walk you through an activity and a technique. It's gonna be a little different in your breakout sessions here because normally you would wanna do this in a group of two to three to four. You wanna have someone who's talking, someone who's listening, someone who's observing, and you can kind of have a dialogue about how it goes. I know on Zoom, we have different size groups. So consider the way that you do it this evening to be an example of a technique or a practice you might want to implement in other places. But it really begins with that relationship of the person talking, the person listening. And there is a, a certain technique which has been summarized on your screen called the solar model of attending. So. The idea of sitting squarely, uh, I don't know about you, but if someone sits like this and is, is, has that baseball game on, which I'm terrible about this and I'm listening, uh-huh, Vicky, that's, that's great. A little hard to feel like I'm squaring you up, but if I turn and look like this, it's much better. If I have open posture, so yeah, whatever. Tell me what you wanna talk <laughs> about. A little aggressive, please tell me more. There, there's, and again, I promise if you do this, my wife tells me this all the time, it's like magic. You feel different when you listen this way. Uh, next is to lean forward. So this is the whole idea of, not only does it help you hear better if you lean in, but, but it's the idea of if you create unnecessary physical distance and you're kind of leaning away, and again, it communicates a little bit like the whole posture that I don't really care a lot about what you're doing. And again, I hope you're seeing this is so subconscious mm -hmm. in what we're talking about. Finally, eye contact. It's, it's very important. I was joking with Vicky beforehand. You want to practice maddening thing, try to lead a Zoom call and have everyone turn off their screens and you don't even know anyone's looking at you. You literally feel like you're, if, if, if your spouse has ever told you, I feel like I'm talking to a brick wall. She's probably speaking about some of these things right here. And finally, and I think this is kind of the highlight of it, reflect their feelings. Let mm -hmm. them know that you care. Lean in. Realizing you don't have to match them. If someone's really upset, you're not going to go down to their level. But you know, that's not the time to make a Monty Python joke. Um, <laughs> unless you know the person well enough and then maybe make a Monty Python joke. She made one last week and it almost threw me. So that, that's, that's why I'm getting her back. Anyways, the point is, we're gonna send you to your breakout sessions. You're gonna practice that. I hope you kind of see how Vicky and I modeled some of that behavior. You're gonna take some time. Again, not everyone will be able to go, but to the best as you're able in your groups, practice this technique, practice talking, practice listening and have people observe what it feels like to have good and bad behavior. Look forward to seeing you after the break. Thank you for listening. For more information about St. Peter's and our mission to connect the world with God's love, please visit us at stpkaty.org. God bless.